As we move on to wound healing, the process should seem fairly familiar since we already talked about some of these concepts in the context of inflammation. In the inflammatory phase, blood vessels get leaky, leukocytes migrate into the area using the roll and squeeze technique, if you remember, and macrophages come in to clean up things afterward. After that, there's a burst of proliferative activity to rebuild. New blood vessels are formed, which is known as angiogenesis, connective tissue is laid down, and the whole area is like a busy construction site. Finally, after about one week, the wound is remodeled by laying down scar tissue that is very strong, even if it isn't always functional. Wound healing is especially important during surgery, which is basically the controlled introduction of numerous wounds. Even though everybody heals with the same process, certain groups of people have less effective wound healing, such as the elderly, diabetics, and people who are taking steroids, to name a few. The difference might not matter for small cuts and scrapes, but for major surgery, it can be the difference between life and death. The next section on granulomatous disease is very important to know for the exam, and it's basically just a list that you need to memorize. We've already talked about granulomas a little, but before we move forward, there are a couple of key things to remember. First, granulomas typically result from diseases that are chronic and difficult or impossible to get rid of, whether they're infectious, like TB, or inflammatory, like Crohn's disease. Second, granulomas are typically the result of helper T cells, specifically Th1 cells, and the set of cytokines that they produce, including TNF. For this reason, you need to make sure patients haven't had TB before starting them on anti-TNF drugs, like infliximab. If they have had TB, the drug can lead to a breakdown of their TB granuloma and subsequent disseminated TB, which can be very deadly. Here we have a picture of sarcoidosis, and here you can see a classic example of multiple granulomas. Please take some time to learn this list, but for now, let's move on. This table shows the difference between transudate and exudate. As you read through it, one way to think about it is that transudate is basically just fluid that goes through tight blood vessels, whereas exudate is fluid and also cells that go through loose blood vessels. This difference helps to explain which fluids are which. Let's try to apply this concept to some diseases. For example, is the peripheral edema from nephrotic syndrome a transudate or exudate? The fluid from nephrotic syndrome is a transudate because it's due to low oncotic pressure that causes fluid to come out of blood vessels that are still tight. How about the local swelling that goes along with acute inflammation? This time, it's an exudate because the fluid results from leaky blood vessels and it has lots of cells in it. The next couple facts are important to know for the exam and should be easy enough to memorize. We'll go through them quickly, but remember to pay attention to these during your studying to really make the most of the information. First, we'll talk about erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR, sometimes known as sed rate. It's a nonspecific marker of inflammation that works by seeing how quickly red cells fall in a test tube. If this test sounds a little outdated, that's because it is. These days, most doctors use CRP, or C-reactive protein, which is a much better marker of inflammation. Still, for the exam, you should know that certain conditions have a high ESR, such as temporal arteritis, and other conditions can have a low ESR, such as sickle cell. Next, we'll talk about iron poisoning. This is actually really important in pediatrics, because iron pills can look like candy, and kids sometimes eat lots of them very quickly before parents realize it. Like we talked about before, excess iron is a source of free radicals that can very quickly cause lots of cellular damage that quickly leads to severe gastric bleeding. If it's chronic, it's not as life-threatening, but it can still be devastating if it causes GI obstruction. One important fact to remember is that the best treatment for iron poisoning is iron chelation, using a drug called deferoxamine. Finally, before we move on to neoplasia, we'll talk about amyloidosis. This is often a confusing topic for students because so many different organs can be affected, and there are so many different proteins involved. Let's simplify things a bit. Amyloidosis is basically the accumulation of protein that doesn't belong. All the specifics are listed in the table, 
you should definitely memorize them because they tend to be high yield on the exam. But remember that they are all just different manifestations of the same thing. Under the microscope, you can tell amyloidosis by the bright green color using Congo red stain, seen under polarized light, shown here on the right. You might not ever see an image like this, but if you see the words Congo red and green on your exam, you should think of amyloidosis.